Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, we have 12 of our hosts joining us today. And let me, I, I want to present you basically an institutional update that we provided to our council meeting two weeks ago uh, in the interest of bringing you up to date on how we're progressing as an organization. I think it's very important uh, to look at this now. So let me, uh, let me take, say that I'll take questions following this program and throughout the meeting, although there will, there will be a couple of other presentations before we go into the Q&A. So let me start with the presentation. Um, some examples of the great work that you all are doing throughout the world every day. Thank you very much for all that you do. It makes me proud, and it's a great honor for me to serve as your Director General. We had two, three now, uh, new uh, member states to join us at the council meeting, and one new observer, Kuwait. I'm very emboldened by that, and we, I've had as my goal for a long time to reach 180 by next year. I don't think we'll quite make that, but we do 175, that's still respectable. We are moving toward universal membership, and little by little, I'm sure it will happen. Here's kind of where we are at this point. We now have, counting both uh, global and internal level three humanitarian emergencies, we've been between six and eight all year long. We have nine armed conflicts from West Africa to South Asia. And so we have to soldier on, maybe that's not the right uh, verb to use with humanitarians. We have to continue, though, uh, the good work that we're doing, recognizing that no amount of humanitarian work will produce a political solution. But it does save lives and keeps hope alive that we'll get solutions. Uh, also complicated by the number of record-setting natural disasters. An upsurge in identity and tribal politics in which we have the strange irony that presidents and prime ministers are trying to protect societies that don't exist anymore because we're all becoming much more multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious, multilingual. Uh, the trend of the future and it's a double loss because we are putting, they are putting migrants' lives in danger, and they are denying their societies and economies the contributions that migrants always make. So we're heading now toward a global compact on migration. This was decided in the September 19, 2016 UN General Assembly in New York, based on the New York Declaration. Two global compacts, one on refugees, one on migrants. This one is well advanced, and we have a number of our, uh, our Global Compact team here who can answer in greater detail. We are, unlike the Global Compact on Refugees, which is, is basically in the hands of UNHCR, uh, this is uh, basically headed by the Special Representative Secretary General, a distinguished Canadian jurist, Louise Arbour, former High Commissioner for Human Rights here in Geneva, um, she is uh, going to be the Secretary General of the Global Compact Intergovernmental Conference to be held in Marrakesh, Morocco in December 2018. We also have two co-facilitators, the Ambassadors of Mexico and Switzerland in New York, uh, Juan Jose Gomez Camacho and uh, Jörg uh, Lauber. We also have a great interest, a, a strong interest by the President of the UN General Assembly, the former Foreign Minister, or the current Foreign Minister of the Slovak Republic, uh, and a lot of uh, others who are involved. We have been heavily involved, uh, understandably, because we have such an engagement in migration. We've supported the drafting and made a lot of contributions to the papers for the six thematic sessions that were held both in New York and Geneva, three each. We have contributed um, through urging all governments to hold national consultations. We participated in regional consultations. And we have also taken on board 
a prominent civil society <coughs> consultant uh, paid for by us, but independently helping to make sure that civil society's voice is heard. At the um, stakeholder conference that was held just the last week in Mexico, in Puerto Vallarta, we had uh, a full day of civil society consultations the day before the actual uh, stake, um, stock taking conference started. Um, we have held our seventh global meeting of regional consumptive processes here in Geneva, and it was devoted solely to the question of the Global Compact, and then of course the International Dialogue on Migration, both in New York in April and in Geneva in July, both sessions were devoted uh, to the question of the Global Compact. I think the key question for IOM is that of the follow-up. <clears throat> this is going to be, I can assure you, a non-binding document. It will be one that will agree on certain principles, certain commitments that we all undertake, primarily devoted to saving life and ensuring that people <clears throat> can get to the jobs that need to be done, to provide the skills that need to be available, uh, and to be more and more regular migration, less irregular migration, and much more attention to the human rights of all people on the move. People ask, what is the advantage of being in the UN? Uh, I see many getting much more public and media attention because people now understand what that strange acronym IOM means. It means UN Migration. So you now can proudly say to anyone, they ask you, what do you do? You can say, I work for the United Nations. <laughs> oh, but the United Nations is big. What do you actually do? I work for the UN Migration Agency. So it becomes clear to everyone, even for our families and our loved ones and our friends. So I think it's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. A little technical assistance here. Thank you. <laughs> um, excellent. Coming? Ah, uh, it's coming. So, again, if you go back to 2008, when I came on board as Director General, I had three principles called the three P's. One was uh, professionalism, because we have to become more and more professional. I want us to be the most professional agency in the UN system. Nothing less than that is worthy of us. Secondly, I wanted to insist on partnerships. We cannot and should not try to do migration alone. And if we are given the lead for the follow-up and the review mechanism for the Global Compact on Migration, we will need still a lot of partners. And we are growing partners every day. I mean, we have many new observers who came on board at the meeting two weeks ago. But the third one was what I call proprietorship, in other words, member state ownership of the organization. I didn't realize when I put those three P's together how important they were going to be. And the partnership one, the, the proprietorship is particularly important because it got us through the working group on budget reform, which is a member state working group, the first uh, budgetary increase we had had in about 12 years. 4% a year for three consecutive years. Staff has gone 1,300, 10,500. Member states from 59 to 169, that should say, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and the budget from a quarter of a million to 1.8 billion. Uh, Joe Appiah, our new director for resource management, and I were talking. We, we had hoped to uh, reach two, uh, two billion this year, but with the cutback in the refugee resettlement program, uh, we lost the extra amount that we would have needed to top two, thousand, uh, to, to two billion. Uh, we crossed the one billion mark the first year that I was here in 2008, so we are continuing to grow. 
it's an exponential growth, and it's not so much the, the dynamism of your leadership. We're riding the crest of a wave. Migration is now a priority for virtually every government in the world, and those for whom it's not a priority, they should catch up. <laughs> growth in the structure, uh, more and more, and I want to compliment particularly our, our HR colleagues here because you've got here now uh, training and career development is expanding exponentially. Still not enough, but it's so much better than it was. Uh, we have a, a rotation program, immensely popular, <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with us now getting into the habit, telling our family, knowing ahead of time, you're going to be in a place for five or six years, you might have settled down. Put your roots down, but not too deep, because it might be, it might be painful pulling them out. But realize that you're in a cycle of five to six years like that. When I was in uh, foreign service of my country, it was every it was three every three years. If you were a really hardship post, say you were in uh, Somalia, they let you stay an additional two or three or four. <laughs> if you were in Paris or Tokyo, you'd better start looking. You better start getting ready to move before three years is up because there's a long lineup for your job. So rotation's working more or less. There'll be criticisms, there are too many deferrals. Most of them after they go to a post they didn't want to go to, they come back and say, thank you very much for making me do what I didn't want to do. Actually, there are very few who have said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> we have here gender and geographic equity. I have to make a confession here. There's a lot of work to be done. It's partly because the way in which we were founded by 12, 12 uh, Western OECD countries in 1951. By the way, we had a birthday a week ago today, and nobody recognized it. Iowa was 61 years old on the 5th of December. No, but on gender and geography, it, we have to set this as a goal or it won't happen. So we have to have a goal to not only to achieve greater equity, but also equity in grade. You can have the numbers and still lack the grades. Um, I was pleased yesterday, we had a very good meeting. I'm so proud of our, our interns here. About, uh, about 35 or 40 we always have. We had a good meeting yesterday. And I was so pleased to see that the geographic and, and well, the, the gender equity was great. We had about 10 women to every one man. I thought that was very good. <laughs> but the, ge the geographic is improving too. So I want us all uh, to make that effort to ensure that, uh, that we are doing as we should do. And I'm going to make so say something here that's not on the script at all, but if you see what's happening now in Hollywood, in big business, in other areas, senior people now are being called to the carpet for bad, bad misbehavior. And I think we have to send, I will be sending out a message before the end of the year to all our chiefs of mission, regional officers, and to everybody at headquarters <clears> saying, <throat> we have once again to be absolutely certain that there is no Start with no sexual harassment, no sexual exploitation, no sexual abuse, and no gender-based violence on our watch. Worst thing we do, if ever we're something like this with our beneficiaries, it is extremely bad for the individuals and their families, extremely hurtful. It's also terribly damaging to the reputation of our institution and our ability to, to accomplish what we're there for. So, I just say that is one thing we really have to work on, and I've talked to <coughs> Theodore Suter already about getting a message out for you. It's just to remind everybody. Next one, please. Frontier issues. I borrowed that from the first CEB. I thought it was a nice phrase, so I used it. I don't know if it's right or not, but it sounds good. Uh, so, post GCM follow up, the post global compact. I'm hoping that they will see the wisdom of having IOM do the follow-up. We have to do three things, it seems to me, and we haven't structured it yet. We have to make sure that there is some kind of an annual review of the commitments we've made. Maybe it'll be in writing, I don't know, over reporting. 
in some kind of a, a global, like a high-level conference every three to five years to measure whether we have really honored the commitments that we entered into in December 2018. But the second thing is we would have to try to help those countries who made these high-level commitments but don't really have the capacity to fulfill them to try to help them to develop that capacity. And then thirdly, I see, I see the global complex as a very dynamic uh, process that signing a document in December 2018 is not the, it's the end of the beginning because you're going to have major issues that are going to be bracketed out. You can't come to agreement on them because countries of origin and destination disagree. Doesn't mean the issues are unimportant. It means they're unresolved. So we have to keep that dialogue going, and I would hope that an IOM secretariat would help lead the UN and, and the larger community, including civil society, to keep that dialogue going and to resolve some of those issues. So that's kind of how, I, how we see it, and we'd have some kind of a secretariat. And I've even suggested that initially, and this should be very popular within the UN, we wouldn't even need any startup money for that because we could draw down some of the $30 million reserve that we have, which is, was intended to stay at about six, $6 million. And if we get the member states agreement, we can draw down from that fund already to get started before we go cup in hand asking for money from the member states. Um, policy is going to be extremely important. We have a reputation of being a can-do but can't-think organization, which is totally false, an out-of-date stereotype. But we have to impress upon the rest of the UN system that we really do serious policy. We do it all the time. I'm just looking at several of our directors here. Our departments are doing policy all the time. Humanitarian policy, a trafficking policy, a returns, all sorts of things. Uh, our whole, uh, our whole uh, human resources policy, gender policy. But we have to find a way to make it more graphic to them, probably by taking on board a senior uh, migration guru whose name would be instantly recognizable and they would say, okay, they're getting serious about this. Data is going to be extremely important in trends analysis. So we become a major, a much more major source of uh, migration data and analysis. Again, we'll have to do it in partnership, some kind of a consortium arrangement. We're already working with Gallup World Poll, the McKinsey Global Institute, the EIU of The Economist magazine, and other name groups. We'll be doing a big conference in January with OECD and UN DESA in New York, so that'll be in Paris. And then uh, structural reform review, that I will leave for my successor because I think it would be unfair to, uh, to prejudice that person that they should come and do what I did when I came in 2008. To, that's how we got the current structure. But it needs to be reviewed now and probably revised. And then this is going to be major because IDPs are bracketed out of both compacts, refugees and migrants. So we will need to do make sure that we are continuing to be the lead on IDPs, which we are in most countries. Economical good stewards of our member states' uh, monies, uh, quick results, accountable, human rights, emphasis, etc. And then, uh, but that's basically it. Okay, I apologize, it's going a bit longer than I was supposed to. Uh, but I wanted to uh, give you more or less the same briefing that we offered to the council so that, um, that you have the same information. I apologize to our colleagues online because uh, they may not have been able to see the slides. They did. But, they they were did. able to? Okay, good. So I think I'm supposed to move on now and turn this over. None other than our Director of Human Resources Management Division. Uh, agree? Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, DG. Um, when I was asked today to speak a little bit about uh, HR, I thought about 
what would be uh, a topic of interest uh, to you. And uh, we have many topics to choose from. Uh, I'm very proud that we have made a lot of progress um, over the past year and years in different areas, um, including on, on different policies, benefits and entitlements, our services uh, in Manila and Panama, um, the, in occupational health as well. We are about to deliver a mental health strategy. So a lot of work has been uh, done, but I chose today to maybe talk about staff development and learning because I think it's a topic of interest to uh, all of you. And if you would be interested to read a little bit more about what we have done and what our plans are for the year to come, then I encourage you all to read the um, HR Strategy uh, 2016 report, which I present to the member states. This strategic framework also gave us uh, a lot of information or direction uh, around staff development and learning. Um, and um, together with the Training Advisory Committee, I don't know if everybody knows the Training Advisory Committee is a committee that helps us providing direction uh, in terms of spending of our budget. It's quite a substantial budget and uh, we invited uh, representatives from the country offices, regional offices, HQ departments to help us set priorities uh, with regards to organizational requirements. So um, just to let you know, DG already spoke about it. Um, thanks to your support and the support of the member states uh, with regards to budget reform, we were actually able to double our budget, the training budget, um, over the past few years. And the Training Advisory Committee, as I said, has helped us to ensure that we use that money in order to set um, uh, priorities. So you can see that we have uh, reached about um, 7,000 staff with that money uh, last year. Uh, and I think this is not actually all the staff that have received training because these are only the people who SDL knows of and have been registered somehow. So usually through a cost sharing agreement. So we believe there's many more people that have benefited from <coughs> training. But these are the ones that we know of. So I think uh, in terms of uh, money per staff, uh, we made great progress and I'm very thankful to the member states and the support of senior management. I'm also very proud on the SDL team uh, in Manila, Panama, and here in HQ that they were actually able to spend all that money, which has not always happened in previous years. And every year at the OSI Budget Committee, the regional directors ask me, Greet, what have you done with the money? And if I can show that I spend it, then we can have a little bit more. Um, and it's a great effort to do so because a lot of the money is decentralized to regional offices and uh, so it's a constant follow-up, but we have been spending 100% of this training to the benefit of staff. Um, you will also see that the majority of the uh, staff trained um, are those in the field. We only have a very small headquarters and we want to reach the maximum number of staff, in particular national staff in the field. So I would like to ask uh, Daniel, our Head of uh, Staff Development and Learning, to talk uh, maybe a little bit more about the resources that we have available uh, in terms of staff training. Uh, and then uh, Davina will just talk a very, um, a little bit, Davina Alubana, <laughs> the, our Learning Management Specialist, will talk just a little bit, uh, uh, only a few minutes, about our new Learning Management System initiative which, um, through which we hope to reach even more people, uh, particularly those in the field and those in remote uh, locations. So, Daniel, over to you. Yes, well, thank you very much. I uh, would like just to take a few minutes to explain a little bit what we've been working uh, recently. And, I mean, our main priority is work for staff. So, we hope that everything or the things, the projects that we're moving forward are actually a benefit. Um, of use, particularly because we try to divide them into different modalities. So you will see here four different modalities of these training options. I won't go into detail on each of it, uh, but just to let you know, we've been working in partnership with the divisions on development of e-learning content. So you might have already taken the ethics and conduct course, uh, NCOP, and some of these other initiatives which we've been working recently. Uh, we're also 
partnering uh, with other UN agencies to get content, which is also available in our hearing, uh, content from UNICEF and the High Commissioner for Human Rights. We're also happy to mention that this year we have rolled out the project management training as a four-day training package with the support of the regional offices. And we continue with the rollout of the project development training and other initiatives such as the cross-cultural <coughs> communication training, which we just uh, recently piloted. Uh, this, in addition to other thematic trainings, face-to-face -face trainings that are conducted in partnership with the various divisions, uh, with the Office of the Ombudsperson and some others. We continue also with other uh, innovative initiatives, so a staff exchange you might have heard of, which is an activity that we've been carrying out since 2014, focusing on various areas, such as uh, training for RMOs, HR colleagues, and procurement, uh, and other thematic uh, uh, topics. And this is basically an opportunity for national staff, uh, diverse staff, which is our main priority, to basically uh, travel to a different mission, different location, learn with a coach, and then return to their own country and bring back that knowledge. So this is something that we keep uh, working on and we will continue investing in next year. <coughs> in terms of other additional resources, you might have received some of the uh, monthly messages. Uh, one, our SDL monthly message on training opportunities. And secondly, Share and Inspire, which is an initiative that we have uh, been doing as an innovative approach to training. So we're basically sharing what IOM is doing, missions worldwide, because we have already a lot of good initiatives. So we want staff to hear about them and hopefully replicate them uh, within their own offices. Uh, we also have some other initiatives on uh, training. So one of which is called Elements, <coughs> sorry, Elements of Effective Learning. Uh, this is a training tool which helps uh, colleagues in order to develop training programs that meet specific parameters. So before uh, I give the floor to my colleague, I just would like to mention what is coming up for next year. So briefly, uh, we're pleased to mention that we're towards the end of the uh, development of the Leadership Assessment Program, which will help uh, shape the basis of the uh, leadership uh, program, the training. Um, this will be presented to senior management for inputs, and we will make sure that uh, well, the training basically addresses the needs of the staff from a diverse point of view, uh, and also well, including geographic and gender issues. We're also pleased to mention that we're reviewing the Chief of Missions training package in order to make sure that we have a way of uh, measuring the impact uh, for our Chief of Missions and how this actually works in terms of their performance and work. Uh, the induction program, I think many people would be very pleased. This will be launched in the first semester of 2018. It will be a combined blended program online and also activity-based program. And last but not least, and we have some colleagues this week attending this people management training of trainers, which will, this will be a two-day training package uh, focusing on soft skills for project managers, on basic communication standards, parameters, uh, negotiation, and also how to motivate and encourage staff. So this is in a nutshell what we've been working on, and there's another initiative which uh, we've been, you probably have been hearing of, uh, which is called iLearn. And as we have some issues that are part of it uh, yet of this uh, uh, program, so I would like to make sure, I would like to ask the to present the video. Thank you. Okay. Some of you may have already heard of iLearn, but others may not have. So before anything else, I would like to share a brief outline of what exactly iLearn is. Essentially, you can think of it as an online learning hub. So one place where all staff can go to access IOM's full training catalog, complete various learning opportunities, and which allows IOM to keep track of training progress and any trainings taking place globally at any given time. To share some numbers with you on where we are with the rollout of iLearn, we started in January 2017. Uh, and we have now reached 19 locations globally, providing access to over 3,000 staff. The aim is to provide access to about 6,000 staff by the middle of next year and roll out Ireland to all of IOM by the end of 2018. If you are already interested and if you would like some more information, please do contact us. Our contact details are available on the next slide and we would be very happy to work with you. Thank you so much.
you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, PG and uh, all the colleagues. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the SAP, or uh, better said, I should say, global SAP, because now we have a, a global staff uh, association, and we are very proud of it. Um, last uh, time, uh, during the last uh, town hall meeting, we had a bit of an update of where the GSAC uh, uh, was coming from and where we stood with the process of uh, uh, elections. There was one important point that was still uh, pending, uh, which was the approval by the Council of the position of the Chair. And uh, we're very happy to inform you that this was finally approved in, uh, in December, and in December this, uh, this month. And so, uh, for the first time, uh, with the support of the administration and the member states, we will have, the Global SAC will have a chair that will be fully supported by the administration. That's quite uh, an important uh, achievement for all of us, for IOM as a whole, because for the first time, not only will we have a SAC that will represent all the staff worldwide, regardless of the, of the grade, so P staff, G staff, national staff will be represented by the Google uh, SAC. But also, uh, in line with all other UN agencies, we will have a chair that is supported uh, uh, by the administration. So we'll have a full-time person who will be dedicated completely to achieving the objectives of the Global SAC. So quite, quite, an, important, uh, quite an important step for, for, for all of us. And uh, I didn't, I, we did not prepare a PowerPoint presentation, but we want to still to remind uh, some of the key dates that uh, uh, we, we have had for the uh, setup of this, uh, of this global staff association. On um, 24 of November, the Global Staff Election Committee has informed you uh, of the next steps. And so we wanted to take this opportunity to, this opportunity to remind you what these next steps are and the key dates. Basically, um, the process for electing both the chair of the Global SAC and the members of the GSAC has started. This process uh, will finish in March 2018 when the Global SAC will be formally in place. So, um, by uh, the 22nd of January, 2018, uh, those who are interested to run as the global chair and also as members of the committee will have to put forward their candidatures to uh, receive their votes for the election, the election process. Um, the GSAC will be formed of uh, uh, about 19 members. There will be, as we said, one um, GSAC chairperson that will be ele elected by all the GSA members, the Global SAC members, so not only um, by the 19 people that will be part of the, of the, um, of the GSAC, but by all of, uh, of the members. And uh, uh, the person will be elected for uh, 36 months uh, for a no renewal mandate. There will also be 18 GSAC members who will be elected in six electoral regions uh, for a period of two years. So we had divided, uh, um, let's say, the, the globe in uh, six um, electoral regions, Africa, Asia and the Pacific, the Americas and the Caribbean, Europe and Central Asia, Middle East and North Africa, and headquarters. So every, um, each of these uh, electoral regions will elect uh, three uh, members for, uh, uh, for the, G, the GSAC. But all of the membership will be electing the, the chair. So the election of the chair is not limited to the members, but is open to everybody. So just to finish, just to conclude, this is an invite, an encouragement for all of you who are interested in representing the staff and in defending the, um, the rights, the instances of the, of the staff to run uh, either as chair, if you have the ambition to lead the first GSAC uh, ever, of IUM or as members in your in your electoral region. It's quite uh, quite an important step, quite an important achievement, and uh, we're all looking forward to, to the setting up of this of this new committee. Thank you. Um, we have a moment now for to open the floor for field missions and for headquarters colleagues if you have comments or questions. <coughs> um, if there are any questions 
please allow a moment for the, the microphone to, to start up. Um, this is uh, IOM New York. As usual, we, we appreciate the town hall meeting. It comes uh, very timely, uh, uh, a few weeks before the end of the year, and it helps to set us all on the same page as we get ready to start a new work. That said, let me appreciate your presentation and make maybe three points related to the Ferris part, which is about the council. And I would like to make reference to the adoption of the, of the resolution 1358, supporting IOM engagement in the GCM process and asking IOM to continue to engage and uh, play a central role in the follow-up uh, review process. The good thing about this resolution is that it came with 100% support of our member states. It happened shortly before some of us, including yourself, left to Guetro Balarta, and it galvanized the support that we heard there, which came uh, uh, in, in, uh, in an overwhelming manner and quoting your words, many of us, including yourself, we were humbled by what, what we uh, heard uh, uh, there. And this will also equip us well as we get uh, uh, ready for the negotiation phase here in New York and we'll make sure that we will put it to good use. Second, on uh, the issue of the uh, membership. I think this is really not about the numbers. You mentioned 169 member states. This is more and more about the relevance of IOM, which is represented by our global footprint, but also by how many member states and how closer we move to universal membership. Again, both uh, the global footprint of IOM, but the, our closeness and proximity to uh, uh, universal membership would position us very well as we enter into the negotiation phase. I know your target is to reach 175 member states by the next council, and that would require a lot of work from many of us, including IOM New York, which will do our part on, on this. The third was the, uh, related to the IBM, which proved to be very helpful and recognized as uh, uh, a global process that contributed well to the consultation phase and inputs fit into the stock taking meeting. And I'm glad to report on your agreement that the next IDM will be hosted here in New York sometime in March. Dates needs to be agreed. Let me finish by just one a quick announcement that on the 18th of December, we are uh, celebrating the International Migrants Day. We are uh, honored and, 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 and privileged to have you joining us here at that day. And uh, let me announce and confirm that the President of the General Assembly and the Secretary General of the UN will also uh, join you. Both they have confirmed it, and that signifies the relevance and the importance that the UN system as a whole attached to migration. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ashraf. I think then maybe before we, we, we continue or before we conclude, actually, we have a, an important part of the, of the the, the ceremony today, and that is that we would like to um, inform everybody about that if, about talk about the long service recognition of staff members. Um, we have a, a number of members, as as we all know, who have been with the organisation for many years. Um, we are very proud to to recognise the long service of our dedicated staff, and um, there are a number of of them who have reached uh, milestones within the organization. Um, certificates are awarded to staff on reaching 10, 15, and 20 years of service, and plaques are given to staff members with 25 years of service and above. And L3 duty stations at the discretion may elect to distribute certificates for staff members at the five-year service interval. And so while IOM has made awards previously, in the last few years this exercise was not completed 
And so this year, we are restarting the awards process for staff members who have reached service milestones in 2017. And given the high, high volume, we have almost 600 awards in, seven, in 2017 alone. <laughs> it's unfortunately not possible to address the backlog for all the colleagues who have reached the long service milestones in the past few years. So HRM, in collaboration with colleagues worldwide, will now continue to monitor the long service awards to ensure every eligible colleague receives an award in the future at the appropriate milestone. So this year, I think we have to catch up a little bit with, with the, the past two years where this wasn't done. So by this time, all offices worldwide should have received the 2017 certificates for distribution. However, the delivery of the plaques will take place in the next few weeks. So following today's town hall, we will present the awards to our colleagues and headquarters. <coughs> but we encourage regional and country offices to also present their awards at, at, uh, at moments when, when it's suitable in each of your missions. But I would like to congratulate all 2017 awardees. Um, Dr. Jack, you want to say anything? Introducing the awards, of course, is our longest serving member of IOM, our <laughs> chief of staff, who <laughs> received uh, her recognition for 35 years, 36 years. Right. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I think that, uh, let me just say that, you know, we haven't done well by awards under me. Uh, I, there was a, more of an awards program when I came, but I, I wasn't sure, I wasn't quite sure about the criteria. I wasn't sure how, how one could, you know, there's so many people doing so many good things in Iowa, it's very hard to sift it down to a precious few. And so I was uncomfortable with it, and I kind of let it wither on the vine, so to speak. But the long service award we've always kept. I was um, reminding the interns yesterday that these are very important awards. These are, these are points in your life. I never understood until my mother died why she kept all of my grades from the time I entered school, my first grade my first grade report card she still had, because she recognized more than a lot of us do perhaps, that these are all marks along the pathway, moving you toward something hopefully ever better and ever greater in the interest of humanity, et cetera, or over dramatizing. But the awards are very important for that reason. People do, buy, and I go around the world seeing our country missions and our regional offices, and. I see a lot of our colleagues do have these awards framed and posted in their offices. I think that's a good thing. So I'm very happy to and very honored to be able to present these awards. Um, I guess we will proceed to distribute them now, right? Um, First, we want to say goodbye to everybody. Oh, our colleagues <laughs> in the field. Look, I always say I'm, a, I'm very much a field person. I've been in this business for next year in 55 years, and 40 of those years I've spent in the field. So I'm very much a field person, and we know where the work really gets done. And we thank all of you, and through you, all of our other regional offices and field missions around the world. Thank you very much, and a very, very happy holiday, and happy new year to you all. Thank you very much for all your service.